Okay, I'm reading chapter four from The Singing Tree, and this is called The Wedding. Sunday began like any other day on the ranch. The family was up with the first crow of the roosters, and when the sun pushed its round red face over the horizon, they were almost through with the morning meal. Father, Jancy, and Uncle Sandor were talking placidly about some fences and new buildings. Mother, waiting for them to rise from the table, sat stitching, equally placidly, on a piece of embroidery. Kate, who had rushed through her morning chores and gulped down her breakfast, began to squirm in her chair. Nobody paid any attention to her. She twisted and fidgeted, sat forward and pushed back again, made little noises in her throat as if she had a cold, until Mother looked up from her embroidery. Seeing the ancient expression on Kate's face, she gave her a little nod and said soundlessly, You may go. Kate shook her head impatiently. No, Auntie, no. What is it then? The wedding. Aren't we going to get dressed for the wedding? whispered Kate. I should say not, said Mother. Auntie, aren't we, aren't we going? This was a wail, loud enough to make the men look up and take notice. Of course we are going, but we can't get dressed until we have been called. It would seem unseem, it would not be seemly, explained Mother calmly. Called? You mean inv invited? But we have been invited. Everybody's been invited. Why, why, Auntie, the dresses and food we got ready, stammered Kate. Still Mother didn't move. We haven't been called yet, was all she said. Daddy, Kate appealed to her father, I just don't understand. You will in a little while, he smiled. You will see an ancient ceremony, the wedding call. The words and formalities in the ceremony are almost as old as the Mag Magyar race. Every word the callers will say, every word your uncle will say, has been said in just that way at every Hungarian wedding for hundreds of years. It's a tradition we would not dare change. They, they should be here any minute now, said Jancy. Yes, and we had better get to work. It won't do at all to let them find us waiting, said Father, rising from the table. To Kate's consternation, everyone got b very busy, chopping wood, although there was a huge pile already chopped, brushing horses, although they shone like satin anyway, carrying water to the kitchen, although the pails were full with the daily supply. Mother insisted that Kate help her with the dishes, a task she usually didn't want any help with. After the last dish had been polished, she said, open the windows in the clean room, Kate, and dust the chairs. The clean room was very seldom open. It was a kind of parlor reserved for the most festive occasions and kept dark most of the time but it was always scrupulously clean. Any visitor who was let into the clean room was an honored guest indeed. Kate's puzzled question, why auntie, who in the world is coming? Went unanswered because mother cried, hurry, here they come. Opening the windows and shutters of the clean room, Kate saw two wagons drive into the yard. And what wagons? They had been freshly painted and each was pulled by four white horses. Wagons and horses were all but covered with wreaths of flowers and ribbons. There were flowers tied to the whips of the drivers, to the headbands of the horses, to the wh wh whiffle trees and the wheels. Men, young and old, came piling off, dressed in the gayest of their always gay and colorful holiday costumes. The wide sleeves of their shirts and their pleated full trousers were dazzlingly white. Their vests were a colorful riot of applique work and embroidery. Their boots were so glossy that an impish thought came into Kate's head and she giggled. A fly would break its neck on them and the hats high and black. They were wound and wound round and around with many colored ribbons encircled with flowers. Here's a picture they have here in the book. I don't see any hats, but maybe they're going to take their hats off. Father was walking toward them, followed by his brother and Jancy. The men stood in an orderly line, and one of them, evidently their leader, because he carried a flower-laden staff, stepped forward. Kate called Mother from the doorway. Come quickly. The call is beginning. She and Kate hurried out just when Father began to speak. May the Lord give a good day to all you men. What happy event has brought you such a long way to our modest home? A very good day to you, our host, spoke the leader. It is a great honor for us to be received in your good home. Father stepped aside, indicating the door with an outstretched arm. Please enter and accept our hospitality. We thank you, said the leader. Slowly they walked in through the kitchen into the clean room, followed by the family. There the men stood in a light again. The leader stepped forward and knocked with his staff on the floor. Our kind host, he began, we have come to ask for your help and the help of all your dear family. We are at your service, said father seriously. We are, repeated mother, Jancy and Kate's father. Kate, to whom all this was like a play, piped up, 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 up a moment later. Me too. Thank you. The leader bowed his head and then went on. There is a little white dove back home where we came from. A little white dove, pure and gentle. She has been kept in a cage all her life, but this spring the door of her cage has been open. She has flown off to the woods and there heard the call of her mate. That is as it should be, father said. That is as it should be, nodded the leader. Now the little white dove and her mate are ready to build their nest. 
We, who have known her all her life and know she is deserving, have come to ask you, dear Hope, to help Feather her nest. We will, said Feather, Father. The leader lifted his staff high, then knocked with it on the floor three times. And so we call you to the wedding of the maid Mary, and it's spelled M-A-R-I, Vidor, and the lad Peter Hody, to the feast and the rejoicing at the home at the house of Janes, Janos Vidor and to the lead me home procession tonight. He paused for a moment and then he added, you have been called. We have been called, said father, and we shall come gladly. With father's last words, the ceremony was over. The men relaxed, began to move around and talk about everyday things. Father and mother brought in bread and wine and invited the callers to sit down. This, however, was politely declined. They each took a bite of bread and a sip of wine and then shook hands with everyone and left. The moment the wagons turned down the lane, mother closed the windows and the shutters of the clean room. Now, hurry, all of you, go get dressed, she cried. I don't want to be late for the wedding, hurry. Auntie, mumbled Kate, struggling into her petticoat. Why couldn't we have been dressed before? We knew we were going. It would have seemed forward to take it for granted. We, they, oh, don't ask me questions now. Kate, help me lace this bodice. Mother gasped, good gracious, how these materials shrink. Kate pulled at the laces with all her might. There, you look fine, Auntie, just as if you've been poured into it, not a wrinkle. I feel like a stuffed goose, sighed Mother, but that can't be helped. Let me see you now. Bonnet, blouse, bodice, petticoat, skirt, apron, boots. Yes, you'll do. Get the prayer books and the lace handkerchiefs. Don't wrinkle them now. Here we go. How these doors shrink, giggled Kate when Mother in her innumerable petticoats, pleated skirt, and apron had to be pushed and coaxed through the narrow door. Suddenly, Mother let out a shriek and stood still. What is it, Andy? cried Kate, trying to peek around the considerable girth of her aunt. Oh, my holy saints, Jancy! They both ga ga gaped at the strangely tall and broad-shouldered young man who a little while ago was just plain Jancy. He stood between his father and his uncle, almost as tall as they were. Perhaps he was standing on tiptoe, but he had good reasons for it. For the first time in his life, he was dressed as only the big ranchers are dressed on the plains. Exactly like father, tight-fitting blue coat with braids on, slim blue riding breeches, patent leather boots, even a soft silk tie. Mother, meet the young master Jancy, in case you don't know him, said father, putting his arm around Jancy's shoulder. I was rather surprised myself, he added with a smile. Kate found her voice first. Why, Jancy, it's perfectly beautiful, she cried, running around him in circles. Ah, go on, a man can't be beautiful, grumbled Jancy, not at all displeased. You aren't so bad yourself at that. But his eyes were on Mother, who still hadn't spoken, and now she smiled and said, It's fine, Jancy, fine. Only you look so much the way your father used to when I first met him. It gave me quite a turn. Do I, cried Jancy, pulling himself still straighter, if possible. Well then, that's all right, let's go. The men eased Mother and Kate into the wagon carefully, as if they were, there were, ba they were baskets of eggs. Uncle Sandor sat between them, all but covered with the overflowing ruffles, ribbons, and laces. Want to drive, son? asked Father. No, sir, I'm riding, riding Barsony, declared Jancy. You are? Who said so, frowned Father. I am saying so. If we're going to stay for the lead me home, we won't be back until late, and someone has got to milk the cows because a cow isn't, intended in, isn't interested in excuses. All a cow wants is to be milked, chanted the whole family, laughing at Father's surprised face. And that is my job, declared Jancy sturdily. I'll ride home at sundown and be back for the lead me home. You go on. I'll catch up with you, he cried, running towards the stable. And that, dear brother, laughed Uncle Sandor, sounds like an order from the boss. Father pulled his hat over his eyes with an almost boyish gesture. That was an order, or I don't know the voice of authority. What a boy. He swung himself into the seat. Come up here, Sandor. You look like a June bug drowned in whipped cream back there. Besides, he whispered to his brother when the wagon was on its way, it would be kind of lonesome up here, alone. Jancy, riding Barsony, caught up with them at the end of the lane. Once on the main road, they became part of the long line of wagons, carriages, and riders, all headed for the village. People were singing, shouting to one another, and to the Nagis. One wagon carried a whole gypsy band playing lively tunes. The sun was laughing down at the plains from a cloudless blue sky, and the plains seemed to be laughing back in a burst of brilliant color and gay song. By the time Father found a place for the wagon and horses, the small church was packed to overflowing. So to Mother's disappointment, they had to stand on the steps. Behind them, the crowd grew and grew until people completely filled the square. From the sound of murmuring voices broken by moments of stillness and the ringing of the acolytes' bells inside the church, they could follow the service. They all joined in the singing of hymns, and when the organ rang out triumphantly, pronouncing the end of the ceremony, the singing and shouting, mingled with the booming bells in the steeple, must have reached the gates of heaven and made the angels smile. There was a stir in the wide doorway of the church. The crowd parted, and the bridal procession, be procession began to move slowly down the steps. The bride, Mary Vidor, dressed in foaming, glistening white, seemed to float on a crest of a wave. 
a wave of color. She was surrounded by her bridesmaids, and as soon as she reached the lowest step, was whisked off back to her father's house. The girls and women scattered into groups, each group talk, taking up its post in a different house along the main street. The men and boys stayed with Peter and began the traditional game, the seeking, led by the callers. Led by the callers and followed by the softly playing gypsies, they went from house to house. At every door they stopped, and Peter knocked. Good people in this house, I have lost my white dove. My white dove has flown away. Help me find her, good people. The door was open, and the women, who had arrived there only a short while before, came out. We have not seen your white dove, but help you we will. This was repeated over and over again, and the procession grew. The whole village was behind Peter when they finally reached the V-door farm. Here, Peter repeated his call, and Mary's mother opened the door. I have seen your white dove, and find her you will, she said. A great shouting and cheering broke out at these words, and the gypsies crashed into a wild tune. The crowd formed a large half circle around the door. Jano's V-door appeared, leading a bent old woman by the hand. May this be the white dove you are seeking? Peter rocked around the old woman solemnly, and he stepped back and shook his head. This one is too old to be my white dove. Now Mary's mother came, leading a small girl. May be this be the white dove you are seeking? Again, Peter shook his head. This one is too young to be my white dove. One by one, they let out tall girls, short girls, fat girls, thin girls, but to each one, Peter objected to the immense amusement of the crowd. The game went on and on, and the hilarity grew. And then suddenly the bride appeared at the doorway, and everyone shouted, May this be the white dove you are seeking? Peter threw his hat into the air and cried, This is my white dove that I have been seeking. Here's a photo. Sharing the Hungarian bridal ceremonies. The crowd cheered. The band swung into a, into a card, cardus, cardas, some sort of dance. And Peter swept Mary into the dance. This was the sign for the real festivities to begin. Young and old danced faster and faster. The bride, bride flew from hand to hand, around and around, until she had danced with every man. Then she was led back to Peter, who had danced with every girl and every woman. Together, they led the cheering guests back to the house. But... They led the cheering guests back of the house to the garden and orchard where long, sturdy tables had been piled high with food and drinks. The food visible on the tables was only a beginning. More came every minute, brought from wagons of the guests in the neighbors' kitchens. There were roasts, pigs and lambs, chickens and geese and ducks by the dozens, mountains, mountains of sausage and hams and pastries and cakes and baskets of bread, buns and rolls. Kate, disheveled and hot but happy, saw Jancy take possession of a whole chicken and a plate of cakes. He was making his way toward the little brook at the foot of the orchard, and Kate ran after him. Here, give me some. Isn't this wonderful, she cried, relieving him of the plate. He gave her an up unhappy glance. Yes. Yes? Look who's what's waiting for you. Kate followed the derisive jerk of his chin and groaned. Oh, my good saints, where did she come from? Leaning very affectedly against a tree stood Lily. That Lily. She was twirling a lace parasol over her shoulder and surveyed the gay scene around her with a haughty expression. What does she think she is, a plaster saint? Scoffed Kate, popping a whole tart into her mouth. Well, just you, well, you found it, Jancy. You keep it, she grinned. I'm going. It was too late. Lily was waving a white gloved hand. You see, muttered Jancy, she'll stick like a burr and ruin our whole day. Not while I'm around, whispered Kate with much, with, with such conviction that Jancy looked at her suspiciously. What are you going to do? Kate shrugged. Something will happen. Don't know what yet. Hello, Let. Lily, she added with deceptive cordiality. Oh, Kate, dear, piped Lily, isn't this frightful? The smell and heat of this uncouth crowd. I feel faint already. Maybe you are hungry. Here, have a leg, offered Jancy, tearing off a chicken leg and holding it out to her. She made a face. Ugh, it makes me ill to look at that food. Why don't you go home then, asked Jancy, taking a huge bite of the chicken. I can't. Father insisted that we stay. He has to keep friendly with the peasants, he said. He made me come home for my vacation, too. And I could have gone to the Riviera with such delightful friends. To where, asked Jancy? The Riviera, a French watering place, you know. Oh, we have a watering place here down by the cattle run. I could take you waiting if you want me to, said Jancy. Not in that nightshirt, though. You'll have to wear something shorter, he added, indicating Lily's long draped ground. Cattle run nightshirt, squeaked Lily. I want you to know that this is a Paris model, you silly little boy. And the French Riviera isn't a waiting place. Why, it's elegant. People parade up and down all day long on the seashore, and every night they dance in the most marvelous hotels, and, hmm, well, you can dance all you want here, grunted Jancy, not at all impressed. Look, Kate, they're beginning to dance again, and look, there is Uncle Moses and Aunt Sarah. They're with Father. Don't they look nice? Uncle Moses, he hollered, waving a chicken leg at the old couple. They were coming slowly across the orchard, clinging to the arms of father, watching the dance with an almost childish enjoyment in their kind old faces. Lily sniffed. 
Really, Kate, this is too much. A man like your uncle associating with... Kate spun around, her eyes flashing fire, ready to pour all her resentment into a sharp answer. But there was no time for anything now because happy, boisterous Peter had sprung out of the thick of dancing couples and grabbed Lily around the waist. One dance for good luck, Miss Lily. Play, gypsies, play for your lives, he shouted. Take your hands off of me, yelled Lily, pushing her hands against him. How dare you? She went on raising her voice. You uncouth jackass, how dare you? A few couples had stopped dancing and many were looking curiously in the direction of the angry voice. Peter's brown, flushed, pale face paled. Looking straight at Lily, he asked slowly, how dare I what, Miss Lily? How dare I what? Now a little murmur, hardly more than a whisper, started up among the people. Not threatening, not even angry. It was just like the ripple of cold wind that so often was the first sign of the approaching storm on the plains. Older people sitting around the tables were getting up, craning their necks to see what had happened. All the dancers had stopped, looking toward the now silent group. Kate cast an anxious face, anxious glance, first at Peter's pale face, then all around her. She knew these people. She had seen happy gatherings like this spoiled by her careless word or a gesture. Without thinking, because afterwards she could not remember having thought at all, she brought the sharp heel of her boot down on Lily's toes. toes. Lily let out a howl that could be heard all over the orchard. Kate, you... Uncouth jackass, supplied Kate hastily. I'm sorry, Lily, I must have slipped. Now you can't dance with Peter, she babbled on, glancing at Peter's dumbfounded face. But maybe he'll come back later, won't you, Peter? First he will have to dance with me, though said a small voice, and there was a little Aunt Sarah holding out her hands to Peter, smiling at him. He was still too confused to react immediately, and she went on. I really used to be a very good dancer when I was young. She smiled at Uncle Moses. Wasn't I, Papa? Now all Peter's native courtesy was aroused. Young? You will always be young, Aunt Sarah, he cried. We will show them what good dancing is. He held up, and here's an image for you. He held up his hands. Men, take your partners out to the clearing. Gypsies, play the core Magar. Mr. Nagy, he turned to Father, will you be our leader? Gladly, Peter, gladly, said Father heartily, even if my best girl deserted me for you. He smiled, patting Aunt Sarah's hand. Take care of her now. Peter threw his arms around the old lady. I'll treat her like a basket of peacock eggs, Mr. Nagy, don't you worry. They lined up for the core Magar, a many-figured ancient group dance, of the Hungarian countryside. Jancy, with, supp with suppressed amusement on his face, asked Kate to dance it with him, but she shook her head and said in a voice almost dripping with honey, I will just take care of poor Lily. Jancy turned away hastily to hide the grin he could no longer conceal. Did you see that angel face on Kate? He whispered Uncle Moses as they walked toward the dancers. Heaven help poor Lily now. Uncle Moses peered at him sideways as if dignified old men wink at all, he certainly did. And if dignified men wink at all, he certainly did. With Kate for a go-between, heaven will no doubt help Lily to what she deserves. Kate and Lily were left alone under the apple tree. Lily was st still nursing her bruised toe, blubbering and sniffling, for after all, she was only 13 years old. You did that on purpose, she glared at Kate now. You ruined my slippers on purpose. Kate didn't answer. She was kneeling in front of Lily, looking straight at her, but she didn't seem to hear the peevish voice. If only she could find some means of getting Lily out of the way before she started some serious trouble. But how? Why don't you say something, whined Lily? I said you did it on purpose. You were jealous because Peter wanted to dance with me. That's why. What? Kate seemed to come out of a dream. Oh, Lily, I was thinking you might get blood poisoning or something. Hadn't we better go home and put a hot poultice on your foot? No. Auntie always says to put a hot poultice on my foot when a when a horse steps on it. No. Well, maybe it's broken, said Kate, trying not to sound hopeful. This was a mistake. Lily, forgetting all her airs, started to howl. I want a doctor. Oh, now, Lily, maybe it isn't broken. We can tell. Try to stand on it. Come on, get up. If you can stand on it, then it isn't broken. There, it's all right, she sighed as Lily stood on both feet. Now we'll go home and put a hot poultice on it. We got iodine home to put on. Hot poultice is a stupid peasant re remedy, sniffed Lily, hobbling along. Kate swallowed even this as long as Lily was going. All right, we'll put anything on it you say, and then I'll and then I'll put you to bed. No, I'm coming right back here and tell Peter what I think of him mauling a lady. She stopped. I'll tell him right now. My foot is all right. Let me go. But Kate didn't let go. She was holding on to Lily for dear life. They were alone in the back alley leading from one farm to the other among chicken coops and pigsties and small barns. 
Except for the animals, all the farms were deserted. Everyone had gone to the dance. Let me go, gasped Lily, trying to put away. Kate was losing her patience fast. Seizing Lily's arm very firmly, firmly she said, you are going home. I won't, squealed Lily, grasping the post of an open barn door. Let me go. Help, father, help, she screamed as Kate tried none too gently to pry her loose. Well, if you won't, you won't, sighed Kate, releasing her suddenly, and just as suddenly she pushed the surprise girl inside the barn. Lily stumbled and sprawled into a pile of straw, screeching at the top of her voice. The next moment, the door banged, and she heard the heavy bar drop into place. She was locked in. Outside, Kate stood leaning against the door, still angry, listening to the rumpus Lily was raising inside. She screamed and howled. She banged at the door and she kicked it. Any other time a noise like this would have been heard all over the village, but not today, not with the band playing and every soul at the dance. It would be hours before anyone came near the barn, thought Kate, and her eyes began to twinkle. Then she giggled, thinking what those white gloves and silk dress would look like by that time. That fine lace parasol lay on the grass where Lily had dropped it. Kate picked it up, sent a silent grin toward the sh shaking barn door, and marched off. On the Vidor farm, the core Magyar was still going on. Thus far, nobody had missed her. Hiding the parasol under her apron, she was edging from tree to tree when she saw Jancy detach himself from the crowd and wave to her. They met behind an old apple tree, hiding like conspirators, and Kate held up the parasol and grinned at Jancy. What did you do with the rest? asked Jancy, returning the grin. She's locked in Viardi's barn, yelling her head off replied Kate in a matter-of-fact way. Look, Jancy, she went on opening the par parasol. If I propped this up behind the tree like this, would you think Lily was behind it? Jancy stepped back and gave the parasol a critical glance. I might if I didn't know better. Well, then that's where she is, Kate sighed. She dusted her hands like someone who had finished a hard job, straightened her bonnet, and winked at Jancy. I'm hungry. Come on, let's eat. Eat and dance, dance and eat. That's what everyone did all afternoon. Holidays like this were few and far between for these hardworking people, but when one came, they threw themselves into the gaiety with the complete abandon of children. This time, more than ever, it had been a good spring. Crop shovel showed all the promise of a good harvest, and no one had cause to worry. God had sent them his blessings in sunshine and good health, and they expressed their thankfulness the only way they could in song, music, and happy laughter. Later in the afternoon, the tired gypsies were given a rest. People separated into groups, talking, singing, and playing games. Some of the men were going home to tend their animals before dark so they could take part in the Lead Me Home procession. Jancy, before he left, fished Kate out of a bunch of young people playing Run, Sheep, Run. Listen, Kate, he said, pulling her aside. Hadn't you better tell Father, you know, about Lily? I feel sort of funny. Kate nodded ruefully. I've been feeling funny all afternoon, but do you suppose, suppose Judge Cormus will be very angry? Jancy sighed. You go and tell father first. He saw what happened. He'll understand. He gave her an encouraging push. Go on, tell him. I'll be back before dark. Kate stood undecided for a few minutes, and then she swallowed, smoothed down her hair, straightened her rumpled skirts, and went in search of her uncle. She saw him after a while, sitting at a table with Uncle Moses, her own father, and of all people, Judge Cormos. Mother and Aunt Sarah were there, too, all of them absorbed in conversation. Nobody paid any attention to Kate's frantic signaling. She edged closer, trying to keep behind the judge's back. She'd almost reached Uncle Martin when Judge Cormus looked up and asked the only question Kate wasn't prepared to answer. Kate, what became of Lily? Kate stood as if rooted to the ground. Oh, hmm. oh, Lily, she gasped, jerking her head toward the spot where the open parasol shimmered like a huge toadstool. Lily, she repeated in a very small voice, casting a desperate glance at Uncle Martin. He was smiling in a funny way. We saw that hours ago. There's no Lily behind it. What did you do with her? Out with it. Kate's lips began to quiver. This was awful. It would have been all right to tell him and explain why, which, why she had done away with Lily, but she couldn't even begin now, not with Judge Cormos looking at her from under his eyebrows the way he was. She couldn't tell tales on his own daughter. It never occurred to her to deny having anything to do with Lily's absence or wonder how they knew that she had. She was plunged. She was, she just plunged, locked her in Veraldi's barn, then shut her eyes and waited for whatever was going to happen. Nothing happened. Nobody spoke. There was only silence, and then something that sounded like a suppressed giggle made Kate open one eye. Aunt Sarah had both hands clasped against her mouth like a mischievous little girl, and above her heads, her eyes were sparkling. Uncle Moses chuckled. Uncle Martin and Kate's father laughed out loud, and the big round stomach of Judge Cormos began to heave. His face got very red, and suddenly laughter popped out of him like water from a bursting dam. Martin Nagy pulled his astonished knees to him. It's all right, Kate. Don't look so scared. Didn't we tell you? He returned to the judge. Didn't we tell you to leave it to Kate? Judge Cormos only nodded because laughter was still rumbling out of him. But Kate found her voice. Aren't you angry? 
Angry enough to leave her where she is, sighed the judge, wiping his eyes, and he reached out and patted Kate's hand, smiling at her, and then his face turned serious. That boring school in the city, he said to Martin Nagy, well, it was a mistake. But with my wife so ill, he lifted his hands and let them drop in a discouraged gesture. People have just begun to get used to me, and now Lily comes home acting like a little fool. Well, I can't go around explaining to everybody that she is just a child aping those brainless, snobbish friends of hers in school. Someday she'll say something where there's no one around to step on her toes. He smiled at Kate again. Or lock her in Veraldi's barn, and then I'll have the whole village against me. He paused, then shrugged his shoulders. Well, friend, it's my problem, not yours. Let us enjoy the day while my problem is locked up in Veraldi's barn. We wouldn't be friends if we didn't share our problems, said Martin Nagy slowly. We can share this one, too. Judge Cormos glanced up. How? Kate felt her uncle's arm tighten around her, and she looked up at him, but his eyes were on Mother's face. We have a large house, he said, and it sounded like a question. She smiled. And a small family. Martin Nagy nodded. The pressure of his arm on Kate's shoulder grew stronger. Small but smart, he chuckled, shifting his smiling gaze to Kate's father. The last little problem we had turned out to be a blessing. Why not try another one? Now he was looking at Judge Cormos. If you and your wife would let Lily spend the summer with us, we'd be glad to have her. Let Lily, exploded the judge, his face beaming all over. Why, Martin, I've been trying to get up enough courage to ask you to take her. He rose and reached for his hat. I'll go and tell my wife and have Lily's clothes packed. Oh, a small, discouraged note escaped Kate. Uncle Martin hugged her a little closer and laughingly shook his head. Oh, no, you won't. Lily would dress the way we do on the farm or go without clothes. For a moment, Judge Cormos looked at him and hesitated, and then he turned and walked away, laughing to himself. They watched him as he passed from group to group. Everywhere he was greeted warmly. They like him, said Kate's father. Martin Nagy nodded. He's the best judge we have, and I want to keep him here. Uncle Moses leaned way back in his chair and said to no one in particular, leave it to Kate. Kate, who sat stunned, speechless, and far from happy at the prospect of having Lily for two months on the farm, came to life. Uncle Moses, she wailed, you are teasing me. I didn't know this was going to happen. This is awful. Oh, I don't know, said Uncle Moses. You know, Kate, years and years ago when my Aaron, he interrupted himself and beamed at father. My lawyer son, my Aaron, he is coming home tonight. He has got his diploma. Anyways, when Aaron was a little bit of a boy, a nasty, strange dog came to the village. He was ugly. He snapped at everybody, and the men were all for shooting him. To this day, I don't know what made me take him in. Mama scolded me. The children were afraid of him, and I didn't really want a dog, but I fed him, and he stayed with us. And that summer, little Aaron fell into the deep pond by the mill, and he would have drowned. But the strange dog, who nobody wanted, pulled him out. Remember, Mama? Aunt Sarah took his hand, and we called him Barat friend because he was a friend he got to be such a nice dog everybody liked him you see kate smiled uncle moses i didn't know either what was going to happen it's strange feed a stray dog you step on somebody's toes then things happen and you find that you are glad you did what you did kate sighed maybe i wish i'd stepped harder i'd feel better now will she will we take her tonight i don't think so smiled uncle martin one wagon wouldn't hold the two of you tonight but look he exclaimed they are getting ready for the procession i'll get the wagon and we will say good night now, said Uncle Moses, helping Aunt Sarah to her feet. Aaron is coming in on the evening train. Train. We want to be home to welcome our lawyer, son. Now we've got a lawyer, a doctor, and a rabbi in the family. Three smart sons to take care of us in this life and the next. We have nothing to worry about anymore, have we, Mama? Something caught in Kate's throat at the sight of the old couple standing there in the gathering dusk, smiling at each other, so old, so bent, with their work-worn, gnarled hands interlaced, so humble and yet so proud. The others must have seen them the way she did because Mother said, I'm so glad for you, and her voice shook a little. So are we all, said Father warmly. If anyone deserves a happy old age, you too certainly do. Come, I'll walk home with you. He walked between them, tall, straight, powerful, the old couple, very tired now, leaning on his arms confidently. Here and there, torches were lighted, first two, then three, then more and more in readiness for the procession, and suddenly it seemed as if the, the th the three dark figures were walking on a path of smoldering red fire surrounded by darkness. They are all so old and small, said Mother. I'm glad Martin didn't let them go alone. And look, there is Jancy, she cried. How big he is. There's a picture. He must have been riding like the wind, exclaimed Kate. See him, Daddy? He does look handsome on that horse, even if he is my cousin. She laughed up at her father, her finger still pointing to Jancy, who had just ridden into the pool of light. Then she sighed and shook him a little. Daddy, what is it? You have got your school teacher face on. Have I? 
Well, then I might as well get it out of my system. Listen, little monkey, I want you to remember what Auntie just said, that she is glad brother didn't let the Mandel Mandelbaums go alone. And remember what I'm saying to you now, today, on the 28th of June, 1914, to be exact, that I hope that tall farmer will always be there to help those two old people home. He looked at Kate's intent little face and smiled. Confound those red torches. They always make me act like a prophet with a long white beard. I was just talking to myself, Kate. Don't blink at me like a little old owl. I know Jancy will always be here, said Kate, still looking at him. Jancy? Where? Kate laughed. Just talking to myself, Mr. Schoolmaster. For you to remember, she whirled away. He could... She whirled away before he could answer. Here comes the first wagon with the gypsies. Come, Auntie. Come on, Daddy. I want to see everything. Look, they're bringing the furniture. Come on. The climax of all the climax of all the Hungarian country weddings, the Lord, the lead me home had begun. Men loaded all the bride's belongings into wagons, and first came the freshly painted gay new furniture. Then came homespun linen, sheets, pillowcases, curtains, tablecloths, dozens and dozens of everything, the product of 20 years of spinning, weaving, sewing. Dishes, cooking utensils, wooden implements came next, filling another wagon to the brim. The next one was loaded with food, bags and barrels of it. After all Mary's belongings had been packed in the wagons, the guests piled into their own vehicles and the long procession began. The gypsies went ahead playing favorite old songs and marches all the way. Each following wagon each following wagon was lighted by six torches, except the last one in which Mary and Peter were riding. The young couple were being led home. They didn't need a light. There was half a mile of blazing light and a heart and heartwarming music to follow. Peter's farm was quite a distance from the village, and by the time he and Mary arrived, the house was ready for them. Furniture had been placed, the bed made, the table set for two. The guests had even fed the chickens, pigs, and the cow. When Mary and Peter alighted, the first caller took them by the hand and led them over the threshold. They stood there inside their home, waiting for the parting words of the, words of the caller, words without which no wedding was complete. Again, the guests stood in a half circle and the caller began to speak. Peter and Mary Hody, may the Lord bless you in your home. May the Lord give you good health and happiness, long life, peace and prosperity. And may he send you children, grandchildren and great grandchildren, as many as there are stars in the sky. He reached for the doorknob and as he closed the door, he said, may this door keep out all worry, all sadness and strife out of your home forever and after. Good night. I like that putt. best of all what he said about the door, spoke Kate sleepily out of a long silence when they were driving away. I always like to close the door at night. Nobody answered. All were too tired to talk. By the time the wagon rolled into the village, even Kate was nodding with sleep. This was one time she didn't envy Jancy, who was riding. Mother's lap was nice and soft to lean on. She wasn't very much interested in the unexpected stop they made in front of Uncle Moses' house either. Through waves of drowsiness, she heard a brief conversation and understood that Aaron had arrived. Moaning a little as she snuggled into a more comfortable position, she opened her eyes and saw a pale, keen-faced, no doubt Aaron, lean against the wagon. He was talking to Uncle Martin and Kate heard the words, pretty bad news. Then more droning talk and suddenly her father's voice sharp and harsh. Oh God, save us now. What? What is it, Daddy? She struggled up frightened. Mother was asleep and the men did answer. What happened? She asked again and Jancy leaned down from his horse. It's nothing. I mean, not to us. He was just telling us telling father that Francis Ferdinand had been shot this afternoon somewhere in Bosnia. Oh, sighed Kate, relieved that nothing more serious had happened. Francis, what? Funny name for a horse. Horse nothing. He was the crown prince or something. Pally was telling us about him the other day. He said, oh, I can't remember. I'm tired. I wish that I'd stop talking and go home. Jancy sounded cross. Mm, yawned Kate, settling down again. The wagon started, and for a moment or two, she was conscious of the dark houses along the street. All the nice little doors closed tight, she thought, to keep out all the word worry and sadness and strife. And she smiled and fell asleep. And there's a picture here. I'm not exactly sure what that's going to be, but there's the picture. And the next chapter will be chapter five, and it's called For Conspicuous Bravery.